Programming Beethoven 9 always presents a challenge for a music director because it can stand on its own. And there's not a whole lot of things that go well on a program with the ninth because it is so heavily weighted toward the ninth. But in this case, we're getting a, a lot of variety. By beginning with the Beethoven Overture, you're getting essentially another kind of symphony, a very concise Beethoven symphony, and that frames the work, the entire program with Beethoven. And it's, this is a celebration of Beethoven year, so that fits. The other two works are um, quite different. And uh, with the Wagner, you get an outpouring of overt emotion that just seems to be dwelling purely on drama. Whereas Parrot's music is much more mystical and explores the idea of time rather than melody as we think of it. So these different approaches that are that overly romantic and uh, overly mystical being framed by Beethoven provides a lot of balance on the program. The Beethoven Leonore Overture Number no. 3 is one of the most requested orchestral excerpts for auditions. What makes it interesting, of course, it's an offstage call, so you leave the stage and you actually play it twice, and the trumpet is kind of the, you know, call for rescue. The first time that it's played, it's far off in the distance, and then 16 or 17 bars later, you play it again, and with a little bit more gusto, and it's supposed to represent that, you know, your your salvation is coming uh, even quicker. So, fun, fun place to play, for sure. Arvo Pertz Fratres is a curious work for so many reasons, and one of them is that he doesn't even specify the instrumentation in the original version. That's like Bach's Art of the Fugue. He doesn't tell what instruments, he just gives you lines that are supposed to be performed. But with Fratres, there are now at least 16 published versions of it. Uh, one of the first published versions with specific instrumentation was piano and violin, and here we're going to hear one that has strings and percussion. It's uh, a work that is conducive to a lot of different instrumentations because it was conceived this way, and it used Peart's uh, Tintunabili style, or this style that is supposed to capture the resonance of bells. It's a very mystical piece. Wagner, the Liebestod, is the last, the final scene in his Tristan and Isolde opera. I'm fascinated by this opera, everybody is, because the opera starts, it's about, in, you know, a love that's simply not gonna happen, is doomed from the beginning. And um, the opera starts with a harmony that has fascinated music theorists since he wrote it in 1859. I just happen to remember that particular date. Um, because he does this chord that's full of tension that never resolves through the entire hours of the opera until this song. Beethoven's Ninth really needs no introduction. It's probably the most beloved work that we hear uh, for, for many audiences. Whenever I conduct the Beethoven Ninth Symphony, um, it, it's an event. There's a certain magic in the air that happens when you're, when you're conducting a piece of music, working on a piece of music, that um, has a brotherhood and um, uh, world peace sort of theme. So typically by the time we are adding choir with us to any orchestral piece, we've usually rehearsed just the orchestra part ahead of time. So when the choir comes in, there is just something that's very different about the human voice. Um, they can be so expressive and in mass numbers like Beethoven's Ode to Joy, it is just a magnificent, powerful, overwhelming kind of addition to the music itself, if that makes sense. And come on, the cellos get to present the melody, not the violins. We get the Ode to Joy first. So I will be grinning inside when I get to play the Ode to Joy before they do. 